Sangamalar of the Sun here with the Englishman in New York a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Tom Massimo, interim UFC heavyweight champion. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing well, thanks. A lot of media the last couple of days. Um, you must be I, sick of us. I'm good, mate. No, it's, it's going <laughs> it's actually really smooth. It's really smooth so far, so I'm happy with it. But it's, I'm sure it's something that you like, you knew would eventually of come course, along. Of course, yeah, yeah. of course, of course. Like, first question I've got to ask, um, how did you come up with the the song it's the englishman in new york i wasn't expecting to listen to some trippy jazz acid when uh, in madison square garden so well i like sting a lot um i was brought up on smooth fm okay. <laughs> with uh, my mom and dad always played it in the car and stuff so i know all them kind of songs uh i just thought it was pretty fitting it was actually supposed to cut into my usual song um which is a great song yeah uh but it, they had copyright issues or something, so it literally just played that the whole way through. Oh, um, but I thought it was really good anyway, like I thought it worked really well. So it was supposed to start off with English Burning New York, when it got to the chorus it was supposed to cut to my usual music, but uh, there was no cut, it was just English Burning New York and uh, I think it's, it was very fitting, it was a good song. Yeah, it was fitting, it was yeah. fitting. One thing that I asked you in Fight Weekend that you were very good at managing was the magnitude of the emotion, of the uh, the fight itself, obviously fighting in Madison Square Garden, like Muhammad Ali is yep. fought there, like Mike Tyson's fought there, Rocky Marciano's fought there. And you handled it well when you were crouching down, you were doing your normal thing, but yep. did you almost have like a bit of a, a holy S moment when you saw the golden aura of Donald Trump to like the bottom of the yeah, bottom that, of the thing? Yeah. That was pretty wild because, um, so on the TVs in the changing rooms, they play what everyone at home can see, you mm. know, like the broadcast. Yeah. And they were showing some moments of like celebrities walking in, but I don't like to pay attention to that too much. I watch the fights and stuff when they're on, yeah. but I don't want to see who's there because it's just extra pressure. So I didn't actually know that Donald Trump was there. When I did my crouch position, which I always do, it's something that opens my hips up. That's the reason I do yeah. it. Not a lot of people know that, but <laughs> I always like try and open my hips up as like a stretch from there. So when the fight starts, I can throw kicks straight away. That's why the reason I do it. Yeah. So I got down in that position, just looking at my opponent. And I could just see Donald Trump to the side. I was just like, no way, that's Donald Trump. And then I was like, looked at him. I was like, no way, that's Donald Trump. And uh, yeah, I was pretty surprised by it. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And uh, you said before you went out, your son had done a bit of a deep dive into Sergey and said, oh, it's going to be a tough one, yeah. Dad. What was the reaction when you came back with the belt through the front door? Oh, do you know what? I, I feel like I had the best reaction that I could ever have. Not because the kids were overly excited that I won the belt, because they weren't. They, I, they, <laughs> like, I rung them, I FaceTimed them, like, after the fight, and, yeah. you know, they were happy about it and stuff. And by the time I got back two days later, it was old news for them. They weren't, they weren't yeah. too bothered. What they were excited about, so I flew the Sunday night, arrived in Manchester Monday morning at, like, 7 a.m., got back for about 8, just before my kids went to school. Mm. They didn't care that I'd won the belt. They didn't care that I won the fight. They were just happy that I was home. And they wanted me to take them to school. Then they were talking about after school, can we pick them up, can we do this and that. And they were just happy that I was home. And to be honest, that was the best reception that I could ever have. They, they didn't care at all about me winning the fight. Mate, if I would have got knocked out in 10 seconds, it wouldn't have made a difference to them. They were just happy that I was home. So that was the best reception that I could have got. Well, that's the reaction that you won. And surely exactly. doing the school run kind of brings you back down to earth, like from the highest of the highs in yep. the world's most famous arena to doing the school run with the kids in the back. Straight on the school run, mate, in the rain. <laughs> we barely slept since the fight, but uh, mate, that's what it's all about. Yeah. I like all that, so uh, I, was, I was really happy with it. All right, for this segment, it's going to be Ultimate Unknowns. So if you can recall, when was your first ever fight? And this could be like with your brother or with a cousin, a family member mm. in school. When was your first ever fight? Um, let me start by saying I'm not very good at street fighting. <laughs> uh, I've probably got a losing record. Yeah. <laughs> that, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think I had a fight with like my friend first of all, um, just like in his garden. I remember doing that at some point. I must have been probably about seven or eight years old at the time. Uh, I reckon I was about yeah about seven or eight. I remember having a fight with uh, my friend in his garden. All right, and staying on the topic of fighting, if you could fight any combat sports athlete through any discipline of any era, who would it be? Um, I always say that I'd like to fight Brock Lesnar because I used to love WWE. And when he came over to MMA, I was like so hyped that, oh my God. But it, it was years ago now. It was like just starting off probably as a pro MMA fighter at the time. It's like, oh my God, one day I might be able to fight Brock Lesnar, but it's never gonna happen now. But uh, 
that would be a lot of fun for sure. And I think I remember it was actually at the UFC 24 Media Day when you got announced. You you did a lineup in front of all of us, and you said that you wanted to fight Brock Lesnar. You said, "Oh, really? So yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh, it was in Nottingham, remember?" Yeah, yeah, yeah I do yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that was a long time ago. Now it must have been three, four yeah, years four ago years at least. Ago yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Um, I think I already know the answer to this question, but if you can recall, what was the time you felt the most vulnerable in your career? Oh, when well, it's an easy, easy answer, and it like when I busted my knee. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a horrible time for me. Horrible time, but. Now I'm actually really thankful that it happened because of so much change for me mentally and stuff since. Um, but yeah, at the time it was horrendous. Yeah. And what's Tom Aspinall's guilty pleasure? <sighs> I'm not really the guilty kind of guy, you know. If I've got a pleasure, I'll embrace it. Um, I like food a lot, like junk food, like fried chicken, KFC. Is that your go-to cheat meal? Or? I've got a few go-to cheat meals. I love pizza. <laughs> I love uh, milkshakes. I love milkshakes. I love um, drinking alcohol, a lot of alcohol. Um, so yeah, just just the usual. Yeah, nothing nothing too wild, but eating junk food and drinking beers. Yeah, and generally. going and going back to to fighting. Obviously, your your future's a bit undetermined at this moment yep. in time because we don't know when John's coming back and, and what have you. And I know you said you'd like to to fight Steepy. Mm -hmm. I mean. Surely he's still somewhat ready to go. Yep. So would it make sense that maybe around springtime, maybe if you're UFC 300, would that make sense? That or? makes absolute sense to me. Yeah. I, I think that's the only thing that makes sense in my opinion. If uh, if John Jones, who is the champ, like listen, there's two heavyweight champs now. Yeah. Granted, mine's an interim title, but that means that essentially means the title when the, the, the champs can't fight that's yeah. what it means and I'm completely aware of that um, but I want to have the the undisputed title is what I want so obviously I'm chasing that but obviously right now that's unavailable the next best thing is Steve Miocic you know I've got a small tiny small window of time when I could potentially fight him before he retires and I want to take advantage of that like you say he's, he was supposed to fight in MSG two weeks ago so he's healthy he's ready to go and uh but why not? I think that, like you say, UFC 300 is perfect. Like it's absolutely perfect. So let's do that. And I don't want to put words in your mouth or whatever. But um, do you all think that maybe John is getting a bit of preferential treatment in terms of not being stripped? Because there's been a precedent beforehand in years gone by, and like if you're out for over a year or what have you, yeah. then literally. Yeah, yeah the inter like there might be an interim title on play, mm -hmm. but then you, you get stripped and then the title's up for grabs. Do you think that's potentially what's happening in this instance? Or? See, I said in previous interviews that I think, think John Jones should get stripped. I actually worded it wrong, mm -hmm. and I don't think he should get stripped because I think John Jones has done so much for the sport as it is that I think he maybe deserves to. Th I, I think that, that he should potentially vacate, but at the same time, who am I to tell John Jones what to do? <laughs> like, if I come out there and think, say, I think he should vacate, he's definitely not going to vacate, yeah, yeah. like, because I've said it, he's probably going to do the opposite. So, um, I think that if it gets up to like a year though, or something like that, yeah. which, in my opinion, we're talking about a guy with a lot of miles on the clock, mm -hmm. the guy is definitely not fresh as an athlete, um, this thing's going to take a while. Like, I know a lot of people, not a lot of people, I know a few people, who've like torn the peck and stuff. It's not, it's, it's yeah. no joke that injury, mate. And it's not, I know they say in like eight to 10 months before he can train, that translates to way north of a year to so when you can actually compete again. So we'll see, we'll just see how it, how it all plays out, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I guess we've just got to wait and see at this point. But that timeline would give you more time to prepare for him, right? Of course, of course. Like I'm getting better all the time and I'm getting more and more mature as an athlete. Um, I think that bigger guys only mature a lot later in terms of strength and speed and, and just knowing my body and stuff. And I'm learning, learning about myself every day. So it's not going to be time wasted for me. It's going to be time that I'm improving. I'm not a guy who spends massive amount of time out at the gym and, and gets fat and all that anymore. Like I... Uh, I take this stuff very seriously and I'm training twice a day. And just two more quick questions from me. Um, you're nowhere near your prime, like yep. as you said, heavyweights, like you've got Andre Olovsky who's still fighting like 43, 44 and what have you, but have you thought about what the Tom Aspinall legacy in the UFC will look like when it's all said and done? Yeah, so I want to go down as the best heavyweight ever. Simple as that, I want to go down as the best heavyweight ever. 
and I've got a lot of work to do, mate. I'm, I'm not, just because I've got a belt now, and I'm ranked number one in the world now, which I am, I'm actually ranked above John Jones, which doesn't really mean anything, to be honest. Um, I don't, I'm not satisfied, I'm nowhere near satisfied. I'm completely aware that there's a lot more work to do before I'm even considered in the talk of the best heavyweight of all time. And I'm here to put the work in. I'm here to, to take my chances, as I've done play times before. I'm here to take everyone out, as, I'm, as I've been doing. And uh, yeah, just give me some time and I'm gonna try my best with it. And I know you're not one for words and like call outs or whatever, but is there a message to the rest of the division now that you're, you're pretty much at the precipice of the mountain? I don't feel like I have nothing to say, you know. I feel like I, my resume speaks for itself. And I think that it takes a special person to walk into Madison Square Garden with no training camp and knock out the most dangerous guy in the UFC. I think it takes a special person. And I'll just leave it at that. Tom Asmill, pleasure as Thank always. You, mate. Good seeing you.